Yep. Yeah. Oh, you want me to sit down there? I was I was so late. I thought I'd better get started right away. <laughs> well, good evening again. For those of you that I have not met, my name is Joanne Drake, and I serve as the Chief Administrative Officer for the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. I want to welcome you all here. It is our tradition here that in honor of our men and women who wear the uniform of this country around the world, we ask that you stand and join us in the pledge to the flag. And I will ask that you remain standing for a moment of silence in honor of our former First Lady, Barbara Bush. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Be seated. I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight and bearing with us. You all live in Southern California, so you know what we were up against there. You know, in addition to our honored guest this evening, Sheila Tate, we have uh, a few special guests, and I want to point out. First, of course, we have Sheila's roommate, Dr. John Yule, is with us tonight. <laughs> We also have some of my former colleagues, some of Sheila's former colleagues, and colleagues of the White House from different eras here with us tonight. Uh, one of Sheila's very close colleagues, Barbara Fabiani Cook, who was Sheila's assistant press secretary. She was our backup in case Sheila really did get caught in the traffic. <laughs> one of Laura Bush's press secretaries, Noel Noelia Rodriguez, is with us tonight. And I'm also thrilled to have some of my former Reagan Bush colleagues here. We have Leslie Sherrill, Kathy Naylor, and Wendy Borchert with us, who served in various positions around the Reagan White House and Bush in the cabinet. And uh, very thrilled that you all have joined us tonight. It's great. <laughs> Our speaker this evening has been a part of the Reagan family since the early 1980s. She served as press secretary to First Lady Nancy Reagan from 1981 until 1985. After leaving the White House, she went back to the world of public relations and then started her own public relations firm with another White House secretary, Jody Powell, from the other side of the aisle. <laughs> In 1988, Shield went back to being a press secretary, this time to then Vice President George H.W. Bush, during his campaign for the presidency, and then as president-elect during the transition. In 1999, PR Week dubbed Sheila one of the 50 most powerful women in public relations. And in 2001, she was named one of the 100 most powerful women in Washington by Washingtonian Magazine. She was not only Nancy Reagan's press secretary, but she was a very dear friend. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome Sheila Tate to our stage this evening. Lordy, lordy. <laughs> if I may quote someone. <laughs> so um, I did bring my specs because I'm getting a little older these days. I have some. Good. I have read the book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I finished it on a flight back from Washington, D.C. last weekend, as coincidence would have it. It was fun. It was memorable. There were a lot of personal stories, a lot of things I remember. There was a lot of backstage, behind the scenes information that I hadn't known about. Um, but all of it was centered towards public events. And I'm wondering if you can tell us first how do you become a press secretary to the First Lady of the United States? <laughs> and give us, give us your first impressions of Nancy Reagan. Oh, <clears throat> well, um, I, I carefully planned the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Not. Um, I was working at Hill and Knowlton at the time. My boss was a guy named Bob Gray, who was very well known in Republican circles. And he had taken a leave and gone over to the campaign as the uh, communications director. 
And he called me one day in mid-December, and he said, I need your resume, and um, I need it right away. There's a White House job that I think you'd qualify for, and I just want to put your name in. And I thought, I didn't work on the campaign. I was, I uh, actually, call, I, did, I did robo-calling for John Conley. Remember he got one delegate? <laughs> <laughs> because of your call, probably. No, I was just, that, I got him a lot of money. So. But at any rate, um, so I sent him the resume, and he uh, called me back, and, and he said, be at Blair House at 6 o'clock. So I scrambled to make myself presentable and get to Blair House. And I'm starting to figure out it's got to be Nancy Reagan. And you know, I didn't think it was Ronald Reagan, and because and, he'd already named Jim Brady. And um, so I got there, and I was so nervous that I had to sit on my hands like this because they were sh like shaking. <laughs> I mean, I'd never met a first lady before. And, and uh, she was very kind to me, and she, um, she asked me a few questions, but, but mainly she wanted to talk about what she was interested in doing. And she kept telling me how, how concerned she was about the whole problem of, of youth drug abuse. And um, I remember thinking, but what are your qualifications for that issue? You know, what, what, I wasn't sure that that, from a PR standpoint, that that would be a viable option. But I forgot about how powerful a first lady can be and what a platform she has. And um, so anyway, um, she, the next day I got a call and they set me up with a series of meetings with Mike Deaver and ending with my personal hero, Jim Brady. And he, uh, he said, you know, it's down to two people. And I said, well, in that case, I'm your girl. I want the job. <laughs> And um, he said, well, I'm voting for you. And two hours later, she called and offered me the job. And that was a Friday night. And um, on Saturday night, I was awakened by a, my phone ringing. And it was the Washington Post, because somebody had leaked this story that they weren't going to get out until Monday. So uh, that, was, you know, that was my introduction to the uh, life of a press secretary. So um, we're going to get into the book a little bit. But before we do that, it's been a sad week in yeah. this country, certainly. And we're very sensitive to that here uh, at a presidential library. I wonder if you, having tread many White Houses and overlapped uh, many First Ladies, I wonder if you could give us a little insight into the relationship between these two ladies, because I'm certain that question is about to come up anyway. And then share a story or two of Mrs. Bush uh, as a tribute to her this evening. Well, um, I came to understand after I left the White House that um, Mrs. Bush and Mrs. Reagan were not terribly close. And but I have to honestly tell you, I had no sense of it while I worked while I was working there. One thing you, you have to know about Nancy Reagan is she doesn't. And she, she treats staff professionally, and she doesn't gossip in that regard. I had no idea. The first idea I honestly had was the first plane trip I took with George H.W. Bush on the campaign in 88. He, we were getting off the plane, and he said, Sheila, ride in the limo with me. And I thought, oh, yeah, yeah you've done something wrong already. <laughs> and, and get in the car, and he said, What's, what's with you know, the problem? What is the problem between Nancy and my wife? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, they just they don't get, you know, they just don't get along. And I said, I, honestly, I, I, have, I, I never saw it. I never knew it. And the subject never came up again. So, but Mrs. Bush um, called me and told me how thrilled she was that I was going to be working for her husband. And um, then she gave me the list of the set of instructions which um, uh, I cherish. The most important was that every time you go to a hotel, you gather up all the shampoos and soaps and everything, <laughs> put them in a bag, and bring them to her. She took, she took all this stuff to a homeless shelter. 
just on her own, but she wanted, she, she figured she wanted to, and I mean, she had bags this big. Barbara Bush was, uh, she, well, she's an extraordinary person, I thought. I found her very funny, but she couldn't, she couldn't tolerate uh, being singled out and praised. One time, for instance, the day before the election, I said to George Bush, you know you're going to win, don't you? Admit it. And he said, no, I don't know that. And he started to walk away, and he came back, and he said, but I'll tell you something. If I do win, the, 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 this country is going to fall in love with Barbara Bush. And he was right. You know, you saw it. You've seen the black pearl necklace post, uh, big poster that's up on highways now. It's really amazing. But she was, she was an extraordinary woman. The staff was afraid of her because she, ha she, she said what she thought. I think that's, and the one thing I know, Barbara and I uh, talked to this, her staff about, uh, if you remember this, but Mrs. Bush would bring me a picture. She said, look what I did. And I said, well, looks to me like you sat and read a book with someone who looks like Santa Claus. And she said, no, no, it was a children's reading thing. And I said, well, the, you gotta have children in it. You don't need this man with the beard. And, and, and then she would have another picture where there were, she was sitting in somebody's, um, like, some low-level staff office with all this junk around. And, and it, I said, you know, a picture is supposed to reinforce what your message is. And this one is very confusing because there's all this stuff in this room, and I don't know what, why you're there or anything. And, and they got better at that. But that was one of the things that uh, I was surprised that in all the vice presidential years that she hadn't learned. And I think it's probably just because she didn't, she didn't really care about things like that. So. Well, I think everyone would agree with me that one of the hardest jobs in this country has got to be that of the First Lady of the United States. Yep. <laughs> I the suppose worst paid. Could, <laughs> yes, I suppose it could be argued that being her press secretary is no walk in the park either. Can you take us through those first months of the administration uh, and of your time with her? Tell us a little bit about the evolution of Nancy Reagan as First Lady, her relationship with the press, um, where you fit into that, maybe a tidbit or two on the White House china and designer gowns, <laughs> and then lay out the story of the famous gridiron dinner in March of 1982. Ooh, we're going to be here a while. <laughs> and I, I want to know how you kept it a secret from Ronald Reagan. Well, that was a fascinating uh, experience, and it's, it's really become a legend. You know, it's, it, was such, it was such an extraordinary experience for me, for, for her, for everybody. Um, we spent the better part of a year misstepping all over the place. You know, we, and I, we means Nancy, I guess. <laughs> you know, but there was too much attention being paid to uh, refurbishing the White House, redecorating. We, we raised a million dollars um, to do that for private money. Um, we did need new China. And China, by the way, uh, has been ordered in the White House about, on average every 15 years. I know everything about this China. <laughs> and uh, um, the truth is that the, the White House will always politely say that over the years there's some loss. Well, what it is is there's gets lost in someone's pocket is what happens, you know. And and the White House China can't be replicated. They break the mold as soon as they make the set. So um, you really don't have any choice after a period of time but to bring in a new set of China or begin mixing and matching all the sets of China, which is also a nice thing to do. Um, but uh, so, you know, there's just too much in the, the, against the backdrop of a recession at the time. So that, that was a problem. And the press weren't particularly friendly to Nancy anyway, because she'd um, been, uh, um, stories had been, had been circulating that she had asked the, or she had, I don't know if she'd asked or, or wished that the Carters would move out early. Um, 
which is, you know, kind of, I, I, you know, I'm sure it was, if she said anything, it was, God, I'd really like to have more time to do something with that place. And she, she didn't and, actually ask them to move out. No, early, no, 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 no. And she says she never said anything like that. So I don't know. But this was before I got there, thank goodness. And um, my much later business partner, Jody Powell, he said, Sheila, you know the one thing we all really disliked? I said, what? He said, the way you all talked about the residents, it sounded like we left chicken, bone, chicken bones behind the couch. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was a pretty good way to handle that. But um, so we, anyway, we were, we were, we were getting, you know, they start doing these popularity polls and things, and Nancy wasn't way up there. And she was worried about it, but she, she really wanted to get this stuff done, and she wanted to do it right, so she was willing to take the heat for that, but then she was ready to turn the page, and that was when we really went to start, the, our staff finally gave in to her insistence on working on this issue of drug abuse. And um, at the same time, um, the March of 82, we knew that the gridiron, the annual gridiron dinner was coming up, and we knew that the chances of Nancy escaping unscathed were slim to none. So we um, had a little conversation with um, um, Helen Thomas, who was a very active member of the gridiron, and she brought over Charlie McDowell, who then was the president of the club, and Nancy had agreed that she would be amenable to, you know, a little song and dance routine. And they, they, came, they came over, they already had the lyrics. This is how right we were. They had the lyrics of the song that were, was being rehearsed that they were going to sing about her. And they gave it to me, and they gave me a copy of what they thought she should respond, how she should respond. And the response was, was kind of a back of the hand to the press. And um, we, we brought in Landon Parvin, who is just an incredible speechwriter. And we knew that she had to make fun of herself. This was her chance. And she's, the one thing she said was, please, it, we have to keep it a secret because I don't want the president to know about it. I don't want Ronnie to know about it. Be, uh, she said, because if I focus on that I can surprise him, I won't be so nervous. And so that was her, her thinking. And <clears throat> there's a great story in the book that Landon told me. She made him, he was in charge of keeping the clothes behind, back behind stage. And um, such an attractive outfit. Too. Yes. <laughs> Very yeah. fashionable. And Muffy Brandon's, uh, and, her, and her children provided all the fashion. And it was, if you've seen the picture, I mean, it's just incredibly. Well, we, we actually have the outfit in the First Lady's Gallery. Oh, that's gallery right, that's right, that's right. For you all to observe and enjoy. I know you'll be lusting after pieces of it. Yeah. The, the rain boots, particularly. The, yeah, those, the boat, the, and the feather boa. Yes, the that's feather boa, nice. uh huh. Yeah. But um, so she kept saying to Landon, she, he said she was still a little nervous. She kept telling me to go back and check on it, check on it, check on it. He said, so at one point, he said, I really had to go to the men's room. So he, he races into the men's room. He said, all the urinals are busy. <laughs> and he runs into a stall. And he said, I forgot that I was wearing white tie and tails. He said, so the rest of the evening, I had white tie and wet tails. <laughs> But that was some of the, I mean, really, well, there's so many stories like that in the book of, that people shared with me, some of which I didn't know. Marlon Fitzwater gave me some fabulous stories about Nancy and Raisa Gorbachev. Well, now that you mention it, probably ought to share one little tidbit about the- uh, The pantyhose? The, yes, the cold arrival. Ladies, you're gonna appreciate this. Um, normally, the, the, whoever's president and his spouse go out on the, South Lawn, out the, out the, what we call the diplomatic reception room, and they, they await um, the arrival of the, their state visitors, and the Gorbachevs were coming. It was so cold that they, they came, they basically 
moved everyone who was part of that welcoming ceremony indoors into the reception, uh, the, the uh, diplomatic reception room. So it was, I mean, it was like this, people so if you, packed. you know that room, I mean, it's about as big as this stage. Well, Maybe a, a smidgen bigger, but it's tight. So, so um, uh, Nancy notices immediately as the, as the Gorbachevs walk in that Reyes's pantyhose have basically collapsed. <laughs> and she, she just quietly, and Marlon noticed it, and he watched this happen, and he said, nobody else saw this. But he said, she went over and took her by the arm and said, come with me. And she took her right around the corner to a ladies' room, and everything got fixed, and she came back out, and no, no one was the wiser. And she, he said I, that he felt that, that Nancy had done more for U.S.-Soviet relations <laughs> than anyone else ever could. <laughs> and still, she and Raisa was a very committed communist, Marxist, and she tended to lecture. And Nancy didn't like to be lectured to. And, and that became a, they, they didn't get along for a long time. And then at the end of President Reagan's term, that when they all met in New York with, with uh, the incoming President Bush, um, Nancy said, Raisa Gorbachev, was completely changed. She just was friendly and nice, and she invited them all to come to their DACA in, uh, in uh, Russia. And, and in fact, George Shultz told me they all went and had a wonderful time. So, Well, you know, one of the stories that I love in the book, it's one that you and I have spoken about in the last year and a half a lot, is the story about the two young Korean children named mm -hmm. Lee Kil-woo mm -hmm. and An Ji-suk. Mm -hmm who both give credit to Nancy Reagan for literally saving their lives. We have a gentleman here this evening who was intimately involved in this story, Mr. Robert Dono, who is with Gift of Life right here. Uh, so I'm hoping, Sheila, that you can give us a little more information and, and really bring that story to life. Well, <clears throat> I mean, unless you're a surgeon, like, somebody sitting here. I mean, how many people get a chance to save someone's life? And, and Nancy Reagan not only helped save those two children, there's another child that she saved who I talked to in the course of writing this book. And it, they were the most moving um, moments that I had in writing this book. Um, it turned out, and Robert may be able to shed light on this, but it turned out that that these two beautiful children, they were like seven and four. They're unrelated to each other, but one had a certain atrial heart defect and the other had a ventricular heart defect. And these children couldn't walk more than a few steps without turning blue. And they would have to get down, they'd have to squat down and get their, and breathe and get their color back before they could get up and take a few more steps. And. Um, so we, just as we were leaving for South Korea, we got a special request um, asking through the ambassador, who was Dixie Walker at the time, um, for Nancy Reagan to consider meeting these families and seeing if there was a way that she couldn't help get them back to the United States for the surgery they needed because in, they didn't have the ability in Seoul at the time. And um, as, the, as staff, normally does, staff said, uh, except for the press secretary. Press, press, they said, no, no, if you do it for one, you're gonna have to do it for everybody. And she said, no, no, I, that, one at a time, the, you know, I wanna, I wanna do this. And we brought these two children back uh, on Air Force One, and I can still see, um, they, they, by the way, then, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, the little boy, um, sat on the lap of this reporter and pretended to type on his computer the whole time back. And, and they were, they, everybody loved these kids. Nancy took them up to St. Francis Hospital um, in, uh, on Long Island uh, where the surgery was performed. And unbeknownst to, at least to me, the children ended up being adopted by Americans, by an American family. So they became a brother and sister. Um, and they lived in Arizona, and then they moved up into the Pacific Northwest. But 
his name was Brett Halverson. That was his American name. And Brett um, somehow learned about how Nancy, well, he'd seen the picture, I guess, of him, of him as a baby when Nancy Reagan took him to the hospital. And, and when, he, he, when he really realized that she had actually saved his life, he wrote her a note and told her how grateful he was for that. And she invited him here to this library the night Tony Snow was speaking. And so he came to that dinner and uh, he said that uh, he, th and then he ended up going to Seoul where he works for Gift of Life International, the, the fabulous organization that started this whole thing. Um, he brings children from other undeveloped countries, underdeveloped countries, to Seoul now, where the surgeries, various kinds of surgery are performed there. So um, I talked to him on, we FaceTimed, you know, and, and spent a half hour early one Saturday morning talking. And I just had a uh, note from him not long ago, he's engaged to be married. So, um, I, and I just sent him this book, right? It's not, you know, it's not that, that big, right? Do you know what it costs to send a book to Korea? <laughs> U.S. Postal Service. If you, if you send it UPS, it's $220. Oh if you send it by the post office, it's only 70 So he got a $70 book. <laughs> but uh, worth every bit of it. It's just, just a, I mean, that's the kind of thing that can, transforms somebody. When they have the ability to save someone's life like that, it changes them. It really does. And I think Nancy was changed by it and she greatly moved by it. And she went up, she followed up, went up to see them at the hospital. Um, she, she, the, and they gave her all these Christmas presents. And it was just, it was amazing. It's an amazing experience for all of us. So speaking of saving people's lives, March 30th, 1981, a day that had significant impact on the history of this country, certainly, and on Ronald and Nancy Reagan. Of course, this was the day that John Hinckley Jr. attempted to assassinate the president to <coughs> impress an actress, as it turns out, if you don't know the story. Mrs. Reagan was not with him at the event, but she was with Sheila at her own luncheon. So I'm hoping, Sheila, you could pick up from there and tell us sort of your your side of it, her side of it, uh, from that point on? Well, um, we were at the, Na over in Georgetown, the National Trust for Historic Preservation had a, a dinner or lunch in her honor and to acquaint her with what they do. Um, and um, towards the end of the lunch, she caught my eye and basically signaled she was ready to go. So she made her pleasantries and we, and we left. And, and by the way, we later looked and recognized that the, the time she was leaving, almost exactly to the minute, was the time he was shot. Um, we get, we're five minutes from the White House. We get to the White House. I go to my office. She goes to the residence. As I walk in, there's nobody in the office, and the phone's ringing, which is very unusual. I pick it up, and it's this reporter for the Washington Star, Jennifer Hirschberg. And she said, the uh, Capitol Police are reporting, the police radio report is reporting that there, was a sh there were shots at the uh, Washington Hilton. Do you know anything about it? I said, no. And I dropped the phone, and I just uh, ran all the way back towards the residence. She ran this way. We went right to the hospital, in spite of the fact that the Secret Service didn't want her to, because they, they didn't, no one knew yet what was going on, and they 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 like safety, you know. They like to they like the, to know what's going on before they walk into a situation. Well, I think she even said, "I'm going to the hospital," and her agent said, "Well, no, ma'am, if you just wait, we'll drive you over." And she said, "Forget the car; I'll walk if you won't yeah. take me." Yeah, she said, "He needs me." That was that was exactly what she said. At, at that point, that you didn't even know that he had no, been shot. Uh, no, we didn't know till we got there, and Mike Deaver walked out, and he had just found out, and he told her. And um, and it was the same uh, within, well, 
you know, there, a lot of it was, um, so there were, it was so chaotic in there. But um, I, I was trying to figure out how I could be useful. She went up to the chapel and um, I went back downstairs and started talking to the nurses. I said, I, I need a list of where anyone who was injured, uh, uh, who was part of that party, I need to know where they are, what hospital. And, 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 and she gave me a list. And I said, well, wait, where's Jim Brady? And she said, he died. And I walked about 10 feet before I found out that it wasn't true. But that was the most horrible three minutes of my life. And um, he was actually in surgery at, at that same hospital as we were speaking. But that, there was a false news report that he had died. And his poor daughter, who was a college student in Colorado, got, in, got on an airplane uh, after driving from Greeley, Colorado, down to Denver to get on the airplane. And she heard on the radio that her father was dead. She, she, drew, she flew all the way to Washington believing her father was dead. And um, the next day, I saw him. Um, and if my head's a normal head, head size, his head was this big. And he was shot right, right there. It was horrible, just unbelievably horrible. And, um, and Nancy was so quiet the whole time. And, and, and that same next day, I was sitting um, in the, the room adjacent to the the president's room with her and Ron and Patty. Um, and they were writing out statements that they wanted to make. And um, every, you'd hear this, you know, just constant smacking sound. And Nancy said, do you hear that? And I said, yes. She said, they're pounding his back to keep him from getting an infection. And she would just wince like this every time she'd hear, she'd hear that sound. And I can still hear that sound when I think about it. Um, but she took, I mean, she, she started figuring out how to make him better right away. And as soon as he was allowed to walk and they wanted him to walk, she had him up. You know, he still had the syringe hanging off of his arm and everything. And, and she would walk him down the hall, and they would pretend to be dancing. <laughs> And he brought, she brought in every card that anyone sent. And they, the whole, all the walls were filled with cards and, and pictures from kids you know, who's, who sent pictures in to make him happy. Um, but uh, it, it was so traumatic for her, I think, that, uh, well, first of all, she lost 10 pounds. She didn't have 10 pounds. But um, she. Um, did it change the way she operated at the White House, do you think? I never knew that it changed the way she operated. I knew that she was terrified every time the president left the White House and because she felt like that was the only really safe place. And I think um, as a result of that, there was some something you may have read about called astrology entered the picture. And, may, and I think it made her feel better that, you know, that. She had some assurance that if he did this on this day, that it would be safer than if he did it on that day. But did it, did it change her security at all? No. It did not. No. Her, her security, it's funny. Some people resent security. The, uh, Nancy Reagan embraced it. She loved, and she, she, her detail was so loyal to her and so good. But there's a great story in the book, I think, about her lead agent is a guy named George Opfer. He's never talked to anybody, but he, he wanted to talk to me about her. And he, he actually sent me copies of the notes they'd exchanged. The day at the hospital, um, he, he went into the chapel, and he, he handed her his handkerchief. And he said to her, um, there's, there's nothing we can do now but pray. And she uh, wrote him a note back when she sent back the laundered handkerchief. And um, he, so he shared that with me, and I, I put that in the book as well. But um, he, after 
normally uh, these secret service agents, they rotate because they don't want them to become um, complacent in their assignment and um, too comfortable with it. So George was her lead agent for six years. And one day he was told he had to go into the Oval Office to see John Simpson, the head of the Secret Service, and the president. He goes in and they tell him that the Secret Service is transferring him off of Nancy's detail. But he, George, is the one who is going to have to tell her. <laughs> this, this, even the head of the Secret Service was afraid to go tell Nancy. He was taking her agent, her favorite agent, away. <laughs> you know, that, that happened all the way until the day she died, that people were transferred in and out. And her final agent, lead agent, she had it in, I think she had him do it in blood, a promise from the Secret Service director that her agent would stay with her until she died. And it actually happened. But <laughs> it was, that was the worst day in everyone's life right. when a Secret Service agent, not just her lead, but anybody on her detail, had to transfer out she was because like those their were mother, the rules. You know? yeah. yeah, yeah. So we're going to go to a questions in the audience in a minute. So I want you to get ready. But I have one little fun story I want Sheila to tell. I had never heard it before. Um, before a, a trip, of course, before a first lady or a president goes out, uh, a group goes out in advance. And Sheila didn't do that very often. But once in a while, apparently, she was out and about. And she w ended up in Las Vegas. Oh. You know where I'm headed here? <laughs> and um, the story was very funny. So I thought maybe you could tell that, and then we'll go to some questions in the audience. Well, let's see. Um, as you know, the Reagans were very good friends with Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra uh, had a, his own private uh, permanent apartment at the Sands Hotel. Mm -hmm. and. Nancy was going out there to speak to the national PTA. And so some group in Las Vegas, right? <laughs> you can see that. <laughs> and um, this was on drug abuse. And so um, she, uh, she, well, actually, Ann Robleski is the first one who, who, did she go out with you, Barbara? Do you remember? Well, but. And she was the projects director. She was right? project. She was the one who's in charge of all the drug abuse um, events and things, and um, she gets out there and she finds out that the oh I know what you, I I I, I know yeah. the, well Anne finds out that the the um, Sands wants to bring wants to bring in a um, slot machine. They thought she'd like to privately play a slot machine for some reason. <laughs> into, Miss, into Mrs. Reagan's suite. Yeah. For, right, so when she's there that she so, could play slots. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, the whole detail's in the book. Um, <laughs> but there, there are a lot of um, stories where uh, friends created, some of the Reagan friends created problems just by trying to be overly solicitous of. Helpful. Um, yeah. Not so helpful. My favorite was Ray Stark, the uh, famous producer of Annie and well, what, what other, this whole string of wonderful Broadway shows. But for Annie, mm -hmm. he had uh, decided he wanted Nancy Reagan. He invited her and she said oh, she'd love to come to the opening. And her intention was to come in and sit down and watch the play. And he decided he wanted her to come from the basement uh, in an elevator that would rise up to the main floor. On the stage. On the stage. The doors would open, and all this um, gray smoke and steam would come out. And she would come through that mist. like. And we said, no, no, no. I think Barbara, I think you were the one who first called me hysterical about that one. And so I told Ray Stark we weren't doing it, and he just went out of his mind. And I'm sure he tried to get us all fired. But um, she was happy with the way it turned out. <laughs> she, she, she didn't come out on the stage that way, no. by the way. <laughs> 
Okay, we're going to take some questions. Um, our only request is that if you have a question, raise your hand. We have some team members here with microphones, and we ask that you have the microphone in your hand first because we are live streaming, and if you don't have the microphone, we can't hear. The people at home cannot hear your question. So who has questions, for heaven's sakes? Right here. I was going to ask you about the title of your book, Lady in Red, which I just love. And uh, then I noticed you mentioned that it was your hairdresser. That's right. <laughs> came up with that. So I'd like to know more about that. Uh, well, it was, I live in Charlottesville. It's a small town and everybody knows everybody and everybody knows everybody's business. And, and the, the best place to find out everything is to go to your hairdresser and you hear everything. So I was sitting in the chair and, and um, the editor had said, we've got to come up with a name. And so Kimberly said, well, where are you in, in, name, in the name for this book? What's the title going to be? And I said, I don't know. I'm supposed to come up with a title. And she said, I know, the t I know what it should be. She said, what? I said, what? She said, the lady in red. So I sent an email right to the editor from that chair. And I said, what do you think about this? And she's, she came back and she said, I just met with our staff. We like it. We're clipping off the, and the title is Lady in Red. It's accepted. So before I even had my hair dried, <laughs> we, we had the title of the book. And she's so excited to have, have had a part in that. It was really, it was well, fun. And of, and of course, uh, the portrait is the official portrait right. of Nancy Reagan, so that couldn't right. be more appropriate. Who else has a question? Also, just because I am visually impaired, it's important, this is, was important to me, but a, the separate contract was was issued, and this book is now also available in large type, oh. which the pictures couldn't be in the book, but the the uh, the large type book is there for anyone who needs it. So I'm I'm thrilled with that. Are there any other questions out here? Right here, in the back row, right there, Autumn. I was wondering if you could talk about the love between the two of them, because it seems that she always had this glaze <laughs> when she looked towards the president. They, so, you know, the letters, the things that were said, this lasted for a long time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, um, the gaze was the thing that reporters loved to make fun of her. And she said she thought it was... If, if someone was speaking, she was always taught it was polite to look at them when they spoke. And she, did, she felt that way about anyone speaking. Um, but she wouldn't change just because the press thought it was stupid. Um, but there, there, it was a true, a, a really deep and abiding love affair between the two of them. Um, I remember the day, the first day he was able to he was cleared by his doctors to start working half, half a day after the shooting. Um, and she and I were going somewhere, and we just start out the door, and he comes running down the hall, literally running, and she goes like this, stop, 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 slow down, slow down. And he said, I just can't help it. It's my boyish exuberance. <laughs> and and they, that's the way they were with each other. They laughed. They, I mean, they were, they were just amazing. We all said, you know, that's the kind of marriage everybody should have. Yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> right here. Yeah. And then we'll go to Noelia down the end. Like you, when I met Mrs. Reagan, uh, I was shaking and had an impression. <laughs> this is Mr. Dono. Yes. Uh, From Gift of Life Gift with of the, life. the two young Korean. And had this impression that I was going to meet the Wicked Witch of the North. Right. <laughs> and um, shortly after everybody had left the room, she was on the floor with these kids, tickling them, kissing them. They loved her. She loved them. Yeah. And I was absolutely dumbfounded. My question is, and obviously is a, a fabulous person, Our, my experience, as brief as it was, uh, was confirmed by your book. I think that that's fabulous that you told that story. My question is, why do we treat our leaders who are, in this case, really sensational people, good, 
kind, com compassionate people so badly? What is it about us that we have to go out and destroy them or make everything that they look? And can we do anything about it? <laughs> well, no. I mean, <laughs> it goes back to the early days of the founding of this country. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Mary Todd Lincoln, uh, Martha Washington, they were all criticized. And, and some of the nasty stuff that went on with Hamilton and Jefferson and I mean, it, you know, we have a long history of it, but, um, and it's, you know, we have a two-party system, and, and, and they get all riled up and go after each other, and there's, you know. But in the end, somebody like Nancy Reagan comes along, and she gets through it. I mean, she, she really, she turned her image around, and she did it for, for her husband. And the criticism of her went from here to, you know, like that. And people started to recognize that she was a woman of substance. So, but you know, it's every, every, every uh, presidency is different and, uh, but there's, there's always um, controversy, to put it politely. <laughs> I think Noelia has a, and then less, it's so less good to see you. So great to see you, too. Thank you. I bought the book tonight, so I haven't had a chance to read it. So some of this may be in the book, but in case it's not, um, I want you to talk a little bit about her relationship with the White House resident staff. Uh -huh. And I, the reason that comes to mind is because when I worked for Laura, the one time I got to meet Nancy, and the only time I ever met her, was when Nancy came back to the White House. And I just and had Laura this- Laura had that party? We, yes, yeah. but I have this vivid memory of the White House staff being practically giddy because they were going to get a chance to see her and mm -hmm. you know shake hands with her, give her a hug or whatever, because right. at that point it had been a number of years since she had been back. Right. So talk, can you talk a little bit about the resident staff who transcend administrations? Oh, I mean, the White House couldn't run, as we all know, without the residents the resident staffers, the wonderful people. Some of them have, some of them served 50 years. And, and I mean, just incredible people. Um, I think almost every first lady comes to really depend on the resident staff, and um, um, she was no exception. I mean, she, and and the the uh, I had the experience, uh, not just the resident staff, but the the um, cabin stewards on Air Force One. They adored her. And, and uh, I got some cute stories from them about the Reagans. And, um, and in fact, that they were invited to, um, I think this was the dedication of the library. Opening of the library. She and, insisted upon it. Yeah. I, I know I have some fellow staff members in here. It, for days, we had to go down the list. We had to call the White House. Where was Anita? Where were all of these people, and including these people who had worked there for 50 years, and the hardest part was telling her, ma'am, they actually, some of them have to stay because there's a new resident at the White House. <laughs> <laughs> we can't have them all out at the same time. That's gonna be a little difficult. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, they were thrilled, the, the, uh, Air, the Air Force One stewards were thrilled, they told me. Um, they, the, Howie Franklin, who is a real character, and he, he uh, and Charlie Palmer, I guess, was they the other. They both came for the opening of Air Force One. And the, yeah. Yes. And, and all right, it was that time that the thing that impressed them most is they got to sit next to Charlton Heston. <laughs> 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 but that Nancy got on that plane, walked all the way back to find Charlie, and had tears in her eyes when she finally saw him. She was so excited to see him. So, no, that, I think, I think you know, very, it's very unusual for, for a presidential couple not to feel that way about the residential staff and the people that make their lives so much easier. I think Leslie has a question. Uh, yes, Sheila, I had a question. You know, the press often seem to not really understand Mrs. Reagan, but it did seem she had a special relationship with Mike Wallace. They always seem to have a real mm -hmm. warmth there, and I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about well, that. Well, that goes back to <clears throat> Mike Wallace was a radio, had a radio program in Chicago. And um, 
when Edie, Dave, Edie married Loyal Davis and moved to Chicago, uh, she gave up her acting career. This is Nancy's mother. Gave up her acting career, basically, brought Nancy to Chicago. But what she would do occasionally was go sit down and talk to Mike Wallace on the radio. And Mike loved her. Edie has, there's some really great stories about Edie. Edie, Edie was, Nancy was not. It's a family group here. Be careful. Yes, like Edie. <laughs> I mean, Edie was, Edie was, uh, Edie liked um, to tell jokes. Some of them a little bit inappropriate. <laughs> anyway, um, but she's hilariously funny. And, and Mike Wallace loved her. So Mike, when Mike Wallace, le years later, found out that um, Governor Reagan had married Edie's daughter, he was all excited about that. And, and so then the next step was when the Reagans went to the White House, Mike called um, Chris Wallace, who was just a, new, a newbie at NBC at the time, and he introduced Nancy and Chris. And Nancy and Chris are like this, were like this. But Mike Wallace could do no, it, no, no harm. And when she was doing, a, I think it was a 60 Minutes piece with him, I was, I mean, I could hardly breathe because I, I know as much as he likes her, I know he can go in for the kill, you know. He was a newsman, yeah. first and foremost. Yeah. And, and Chris is exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. But um, they, they uh, and they sometimes got mad at each other, but, but they always ended up being friends again, so. You know, Sheila, one of the things you and I have talked about, and I, I know others in this audience have said it too, that those of us who were privileged enough to work with her and for her over the years came to know the real Nancy Reagan. Mm -hmm. And uh, the White House staff, they loved her to death, and, and we loved her to death. And now there may be days that we weren't as fond of her as other days, <laughs> but we did love her. and. Yeah. I wonder if you could just tell us, uh, as we finish up here, what is it you think about her that sort of caused this constant misunderstanding? And, and tell us what your favorite part of Nancy Reagan was. Well, what do you mean by misunderstanding? You mean well, just, the why, interpretation why did the press, of the press? Why did the press not understand it? Why did the general public not see what we saw? Well, the press wanted her to be pro-abortion, and um, uh, they wanted her to support the Equal Rights Amendment. You know, and she said, "I'm for equal rights for women. I just don't want to. I don't believe it needs to be an amendment to the Constitution." Mm -hmm. And, um, but it, unless at that point, anyway, unless you ha held those positions, they were antagonistic toward you mm -hmm. in general. Not not completely, but in general. Um, they weren't predisposed to really like you. So that, that you had to break through that over time. Um, and I think she did. Um, but she always was reserved with, with reporters. She, she knew she didn't want to make a misstep. She didn't want to say anything that would embarrass her husband or uh, create a problem. So she was always as careful as she could be. And that sort of ends up with you tending to you know, keep yourself to yourself. And what was the other? What was it? And what do you? What is it about her that you think people should know? What is the? Well, where is, who is the real Nancy Reagan? That what was interesting to me <clears throat> was that for for a woman who really had never had a staff until the White House, she was. The first thing she said to me was, "I will always take your calls." Well, for a press secretary, that's like gold, you know, that, because that means the press knows they can get an answer if they call me, that I will have talked to her and I will be able to tell them what they need. And that's, that was important over a period of time. Um, but, and, and she was always true to her word. And there were days where I, it, I might have called her 10 times, I mean, when something was breaking. But she said, I just don't want to be surprised. I, I, you know, I want to. Talk about it before you respond if it's something you don't quite know how I feel. And um, she, she um, I don't know, she, the day I left, 
she said, from now on, I always called her Mrs. Reagan. She said, from now on, I want you to call me Nancy. And she started, well, in 1998, my husband died, had a heart attack and dropped dead. And um, she called, her father had told her that grieving people need to cry and that you should help your friends cry. She called me once a week, made me get on the phone with her. And as I say, I was trying to bill by the hour at my company, and we would have an hour long cry fest. But that was the kind of friend she became. I mean, and, and um, we went from a professional relationship to a personal friendship that, that, I mean, you cannot have a better friend than Nancy Reagan. And that's the truth. She, she kept secrets. She was famous for keeping secrets. She, yeah. She, if, if you told her something in confidence, it never, ever went anywhere else. You could, you could take that to the bank. She was, she was an amazing person. Well, I am thrilled that all of you came. Um, thank you, Sheila, for sharing all this. I'm I can't emphasize. <laughs> there are so many fun stories, really insights into the White House, the Reagan White House, Nancy Reagan, Ronald Reagan, what goes on behind the scenes, the press secretary. You know, I think it's probably a little bit different than it is today. We, we had a lid on our press. We didn't have tweets going out in the middle of the night. <laughs> we didn't have social media. Uh, but we had a great deal of respect. We didn't for... even have cell phones. <laughs> She's absolutely right. We did not have cell phones. We carried pagers, and man, they went off 24-7. But we, we pretty much knew when we left the White House at the end of the day that you probably weren't going to hear back from someone until the next morning, unless there was an emergency, of course. Uh, it was a pager. Yeah, that pager was nasty. I was never so happy as to get rid of that pager when I left there. It must have weighed 10 pounds. Oh, it was horrible. And the, and the, you know, the uh, radios that we used, we literally called them bricks. That, they were that heavy. Yeah. It was the only way we could communicate with each other. But, uh, so it was, it was a different time back then. And um, I, don't, I suppose we had fake news. We didn't have fake love, certainly, in, in our White House. Um, <laughs> And uh, so I thank all of you for coming. I hope you'll come back for our next uh, event in a couple of weeks. Sheila has agreed to autograph her book. If you don't have a copy yet, you can get one here before you go into the line, or you can, of course, get one inside the museum store. She'll, of course, take questions as you're going through, so get them ready. Um, she also brought a few things that we, um, some papers that she brought, some sketches, just some fun things. We'll have them there. She can, you can ask her questions, talk about them a little bit. Um, and we'll see you all in the museum store in just a few minutes. Thank you all for coming. I knew it would be fun. <laughs>